Hey everyone, the first mindset shift that you're going to have to go through to actually generate a level of consistency here that is going to break you through on the scale, lose weight week on week, is that <clears throat> any food addiction slash obsession you have is something that you've trained. It doesn't come out of nowhere. And I think a lot of people will blame the environment, the culture right now for their troubles with food, their obsession with food. And I think that would be actually quite a reasonable analysis. I think that's fairly fair. But this stuff doesn't come out of nowhere. You still train yourself into these behaviors. And if you are constantly using food as a pick-me-up, as a, as a, sorry, beyond pick-me-up, because there's many ways that food is used, but to soothe, to pick-me-up, to stuff, to suppress, to numb a particular feeling or emotion. But generally, if you're using food, an external item to quell an internal problem, to deal with an internal emotional feeling that you're struggling with. Well, you are constantly teaching your brain, your mind, that pattern of behavior. You are teaching your brain and your mind that that is an appropriate response to you feeling sad or feeling stressed. So of course you're gonna keep doing it. And people wonder how on earth, there's a conversation I literally just had with a client literally no more than five minutes ago. People wonder how on earth they can break the food obsession, break that addiction, break this cycle. Well, it feels really hard because you're stuck in it and you're constantly spinning round and round this sort of perpetual vortex of I feel bad, food is, I'm going to eat food as a response to that, signaling and subcommunicating to your brain that food is the answer, even though you know better. And literally, my client just said to me, I know logically, Ryan, that food is not the answer to stress, that it doesn't help solve the stress, that, yeah, it takes away the pain of the stress for a, a brief moment, but it doesn't actually help. Um, it doesn't relieve the actual cause of the stress and change my life or, or the problem in my life that caused the stress in the first place, but I keep doing it. Well, logically, I know what I'm doing is wrong, and I know I shouldn't be turning to food, and I feel so rubbish after. Why on earth do I keep doing it? Because weight loss isn't logical. Everyone going on about logic and being rational all the time. This is, this is a highly emotional experience. Your weight loss journey is a highly emotional experience, and to think you're going to apply logic to it is frankly laughable. I don't mean to sound condescending, but if you believe that right now, get out of it. This is an emotional experience, and you're going to have to deal with that. Um, do you like my sexy mug, by the way? It's something. It's something special, isn't it? So how do you break food addiction or obsession? You stop that cycle. You have to train your brain to not expect food as the solution, as the answer, because that's what happens. You get the trigger, which is the, uh, excuse me, which is the uh, the feeling, the prevailing feeling or an emotion, the reason why you want to eat, the frustration, the loneliness, the boredom, the stress, whatever it might be for you. And of course, naturally, if you've always engaged in this pattern of behavior, food is what comes next, right? And usually for people, it's, you know, calorie. it's usually not fruit, it's usually not strawberries, but it's really calorific, you know, oily, junk, greasy food, whatever it might be, chocolate, whatever it might be. Or for the non-sweet tooth folks, it might be something like chips, crisps, to my fellow Brits, um, something safe that is also you know equally terrible for you in many cases um and so junk food burgers whatever fast food savory fast food and so that is just the assumed pattern of behavior that your brain expects and it feels familiar this is the other thing as well i think a lot of people don't realize and this is a slightly different point but i think it's all related and frankly i've got very little structure for this video so we're just going we're just throwing some mud at the wall and seeing what resonates with you guys hoping it helps you guys out in some way um but that's the thing about cravings a lot of people overestimate how much their cravings are predicated on taste when it's more so about familiarity and comfort, have you noticed when it comes to cravings, when it comes to honoring and answering cravings, you usually only go for the same three or four foods anyway. You don't crave wildly different things in your diet. You don't crave wildly different brands of food. If you do crave ice cream like I used to back in the day, you're not interested in vanilla ice cream or raspberry ripple or chocolate ice cream. I mean, you might be interested in one of those things, but you're not interested in all of those. You want, or as I wanted back in the day, I wanted the Ben and Jerry's cookie dough ice cream. Ben other Ben and Jerry's wouldn't do it. The fish food, that wouldn't do it for me. Ben and Jerry's, banana, whatever the other flavors are. None of those would cut it, cut it for me. I had to have the cookie dough. Why? Because it's not about taste. It's about comfort. It's about familiarity. And when you are emotionally eating, so you are eating as a response to emotion, emotional eating, you, you're going for comfort. You're going for nostalgia more than you are taste because it's providing some certainty. It's providing reliability after a stressful or a difficult day or a day that's been up and down in terms of your emotions. It's amazing. People literally use junk food to be their friend because it's reliable, because it's safe, because it's guaranteed, because they know what it tastes like. There's not a risk to it. We know how it tastes. It's safe. It's familiar. It's not about taste. Now, it might 
taste good because it's, it's piled with artificial nonsense that gets us hooked, that food manufacturers put in junk food to get us hooked. So that won't help, right? You don't get that with apples, do you? That won't help with junk food. But this is a pattern of behavior that we are training ourselves. We are showing ourselves that food is an appropriate response to emotion. And it's not, you're not six years old, it's not. It's not appropriate whatsoever. So you have to break that cycle. So how do you do that then? How do you begin to separate feelings from actions in terms of feelings? I feel set, sad, I feel stressed, I feel lonely. Action being, I'm gonna to turn to food as something to do, the trigger and then the response to the trigger being food. That is an association that you've trained. Your neuro pathways, the synapses you use, you have trained this into your mind. How do you stop it? Well, this one is difficult, but you just stop doing it. And this is gonna sound really reductive. It's gonna sound very pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Straps. And this is not my only advice on this subject, subject, but there's so much that I'm gonna to cover today that I can't afford to go to levels and levels. I could do a video solely on food addiction, solely on emotional eating, and it would be five hours long, and I still would have only scratched the surface. This is what I talk about all day with my clients. I still would have only scratched the surface. So I have to decide what I'm not going to say, what I will say here, how many layers I'm gonna peel back on every subject I discuss here. But this is what I wish to relay to you today, is you must break that cycle by not engaging in the cycle, knowing that it gets a great deal easier. In the same way that every time you say yes, to emotional eating, you feel weaker and you feel more subject, more of a victim to the inevitability of the cycle. When you say no adversely, you build up this tolerance and you build up this separation from the feeling to the action of eating. So again, in the opposite slash same way that when you say yes to emotional eating, you feel weaker because you subcommunicate to yourself that food is the response to emotion. That's the pattern of behavior your brain gets used to and you feel crap about that pattern. So it's disempowering. In the opposite way, it's very empowering when you start saying no to those cravings, no to the desire to eat all the time. Um, in the same way, that that no, it becomes strengthened in times and it becomes easier and more natural to say in time because you start sub-communicating to yourself that fruit isn't the answer and it isn't appropriate response to whatever it is you're thinking and feeling with regards to food at the time. Makes sense? Um, there's so much here. There's so much here. I think the next mindset, mindset shift I want to discuss, and I'll go all over the shop with this. As you can tell already, I've already alluded to it. I've already stated it very simply, but it's probably coming across in how I'm speaking. There is no structure to what we're talking about today. I've got a couple of notes, but frankly, I've read very little of them. But the second mindset shift I want to share with you is that what you want and what you need in life are two very different things. And, you know, and you'll see this in many, many areas of your life. What is best for you? What is actually not just healthy, but what is going to make you a happy, successful individual? If not necessarily aligned with all of your earthly desires, right? All of the things you want. And needs and wants are two very different things. And the part of your mind that goes after what it wants, what it desires, is constantly going to wrestle with the part that knows what it needs and knows what is best for you. Because believe it or not, there is a part of you that knows what you're doing is wrong when, he, when you're doing something that is wrong objectively let's say that's we're getting into murky territory there with saying objectively what you think is wrong but you get you smell what i'm stepping in as they say in the north of england you smell what i'm stepping in you get what i mean so you might well want the cake but is it what you need maybe you need a a, a nice little fruit snack maybe you don't need any food whatsoever you might well want the pizza but is it what you really need? Too many people give into the wants and they don't honor their needs. They don't honor what is best for them, what they know they should be doing. And it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. As I said a few minutes ago, you're not a six year old anymore. Children ask for what they want all the time. Mom, dad, can I have this? Can I have that oh, ice cream? They're just impulsive little creatures, aren't they kids? We've all been there. We've all been there. We've all been kids. I don't mean to sound condescending. Kids are great. But they're just impulsive little creatures that run around pointing at things and saying, I want that, mom. I want that, dad. <laughs> right? And when they're exposed to a junk food environment, oh, this is another tangent, but I mean, we're screwed, aren't we? With the youth of today, we're absolutely screwed because junk food is everywhere. They're so used to being stimulated by it. Anyway, it's just even if you manage your kids very, very well, it's, you know, from a health perspective, it's really, really hard. Um, but children ask what they want all the time. It's immature. 
you know, to only think about what you want all the time and to only make decisions based on what you want. And I suppose part of adulthood is learning that you can't always just do what you want. Life isn't that straightforward. You need to pay the bills. You know, you're not going to last very long if you feed yourself terrible foods and, and you just give in to all of your vices. You, you know, you might destroy friendships and relationships by only doing things that you want in the moment and exercising zero discipline. And adulthood is, is when you realize that you can't just have willy nilly what you want all the time. So my challenge to you is to stop indulging that voice, that want voice, excuse me. Um, I want cake, I want pizza, me, 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 me. <laughs> Time to grow up, quite simply put. And you don't need to hear this from a young whippersnapper like me. Well, maybe you do, maybe that's why I'm saying it, because I know uh, on some level that you do need to hear this. It's not, you know, a reward, it's not a, a, a treat. You don't get to be an impulsive little creature running around, you know, th the store and picking up all of the things that you want. That's not what life is about. It's time to fuel. It's not time for a tree, a reward, a pick me up. So how do you begin to listen to your needs and turn off that want voice a little bit? Well, firstly, this is what's really interesting. And I've had a couple of conversations with clients recently about the role of the gut. And I don't mean, I mean emotionally, by the way, I don't actually mean um, in terms of a, a, a microbiota sense, a microbiome sense, but that as well. But your gut will tell you what to do. Your gut knows when you're about to eat something, but you simultaneously have goals of losing weight. It, it knows. If you sit there and ask yourself, do I really need this? Your gut will tell you the answer. Gut is a great instinct, but our stories, our projections, our insecurities, our fears, our limiting beliefs, basically our stories, what we believe, get in the way. Um, and so cut through that and listen to your gut and ask yourself, do I need this food? Do I really need this pizza right now? Do I really need this cake right now? Is that necessary? The second step um, to turn off that want voice and start listening to your needs is in a similar way to ask, I suppose it's similar to the gut issue, but ask yourself when you're about to break, am I actually hungry right now? Am I actually hungry right now? Nobody does this. Nobody does any self auditing. They are literally just mindlessly. And there's several reasons for this, by the way. I'm going to say it like it's a really simple solution, but they are mindlessly just running into the kitchen, grabbing food. They're mindlessly just going to the restaurant and ordering what they want. It's all very, very sort of just automated patterns of behavior that have little awareness over because they've built them into habits. And that's why they require little awareness, because it's something that's on autopilot, because you've established that habit. By asking yourself, am I actually hungry? you are doing at least some level of auditing. Now, just simply asking yourself, am I actually hungry when you're thinking about eating chocolate is not a guarantee that you don't eat the chocolate, obviously. It is quite, as with everything I'm discussing today, it's not that straightforward, right? This mental and emotional side of weight loss of food choices, it's really, really hard. So I don't mean to give the impression that I'm very flippant with my advice. Like, oh yes, this will solve everything, right? These reframes, these affirmations, these different perspectives, insights that I'm trying to plant in your head, None of this to say it's going to make, you know, uh, solving these issues a walk in the park, but I certainly believe it will help. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today spending my time trying to give this advice. But ask yourself, am I actually hungry right now? And it's at least something. It's at least something to challenge you when you're about to do something. It's at least something in the wording that plays devil's advocate and gets you to think, oh, maybe I'm not. Right. And to create some awareness and mindfulness and consciousness around that rather than just being this mindless vessel that runs into the kitchen every time they're bored, stressed, angry, whatever it might be. And the final thing that can really help you turn off that one voice and start listening to your needs is by not externalizing internal problems. We talked about this uh, 10 minutes ago and looking for food as a solution to something wrong internally, something wrong in your life. And people do this all the time. You know, people are lonely and they go and eat food instead of getting a boyfriend or a girlfriend, right? This is, and I know this sounds laughable. I know this sounds like easy stuff to spot in your behavior, but people are in denial. People are in denial. And maybe they're not even in denial. Maybe ignorance is bliss. Maybe they're not even aware of this anyway. But I think there's a lot. I mean, when I think about me, let's do, because I, I can only really, I was about to say, I can only really talk about that in my life. That's not true. I've worked with over 300 clients now, so I've got the reference experience from that. But certainly I've only lived in my consciousness. So the the fairest analysis I can give, or the most the most detailed analysis, at least I can give, is of my life. And with my boredom eating back in my student days, as many of you guys know, that, that was one of my biggest weight loss obstacles. Um, it's the, the boredom eating, you know, it's normal to be bored. That's a normal feeling. But I was experiencing so much boredom because I was unfulfilled by my course. Because even outside of university, I wasn't really, you know, making the most of the university experience. You know, jo joining clubs. Um, 
and doing extracurricular things necessarily. By the time my third year came around, I wasn't really maximizing it. I wasn't really putting in all the effort in, in many areas of my life. And it just led me to, I'd go to university, I'd go to the library for a little while, I'd write a little bit of my essay every day, but I was so bored and I had my friends, I wasn't lonely, but we were just, we were all broke as well, right? There's nothing to do. And so food, food and prison break, Food and Lost, if you remember these shows. Food and 24, I used to, Jack Bauer, CTU. I used to love that. Jack Bauer, CTU, and Pop-Tarts, right? I would just nail packets of Pop-Tarts. Um, and this that was my story, or, or rather, that was my pattern of behavior. That was my error in using something external. Food, in this case, people use other vices, but we're here today talking about food largely, aren't we? But using food to, to sort of quell an internal problem. And now, this started to disappear, not entirely, but this made huge waves. I made huge waves with the border meeting when I graduated university and was forced to actually go out into the real world and get my first full-time job. So there was nine, sl slightly more with travel time, nine or 10 hours a day, where I was at work or on the way to work to where, yeah, I mean, I'd still think about food. I was still not perfect at this point. I still had a bad relationship with food even when I started in the working world. But in terms of that border meeting very specifically, well, there's at least half a day where that's disappeared because I couldn't afford to do that. I was busy working and I was stimulated by the work I was doing as well. That really helps. Um, so it wasn't just having any job, right? It was having one that, that stimulated me. And I wasn't therefore looking for things, you know, to give me some engagement stimulation as a quell to boredom because I just wasn't bored as much. Now, as it so happens when I came home or on the weekends, well, I still would battle with the boredom then, which I don't do to this day because I've got other things going on in my life. And, um, you know, everyone moved out of, you know, all of my university friends, they all, I got a job in the city that I studied in, York, in the UK. And all of my friends, at bar one or two, certainly all of my close friends disappeared. They all went back to their respective family homes or those areas and got jobs in those areas, which wasn't uh, too far away, but I would never see, I wouldn't see them regularly again, like I had been every single day throughout my university years, um, throughout the term times. And so that's when boredom might kick in again at the weekends because there wasn't much going on. But again, that was just all an excuse. A curve. I've, I could have way more going on like I now do with all the clubs and the sports and the other things I'm involved with, with running a bit. But like there's there's other stuff. But I have a much better social life now. There's, there's different things going on for me now on my weekends and on my evenings. So for me, it was just answering the boredom and realizing that food wasn't appropriate answer to that. And I think it's worth saying as well, I didn't know I was doing this at the time. And a lot of you, until until you have those moments of epiphany and realizations, maybe we can trigger it for some people in this live stream. That'd be really cool. Um, but until you have these epiphanies and realizations, you don't even know that what you're doing is emotional eating. You don't even realize that you turn to food when you're stressed. But suddenly you hear someone talk about it or you read about stress eating in a book or you, you hear that somewhere and you're like, oh, God, I do that, too. So I'm hoping there's a couple of epiphanies happening uh, for folks watching this. But yeah, um, I've gone away from the point slightly, but yeah, not externalizing internal problems and looking as food to the solution to stuff, to soothe, to numb, to distract. And really, there might just be a couple of personal things in your life that need solving. For me, it was the boredom, right? I go and I inadvertently solved the boredom by getting a job. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. And then slowly I worked on how to fill my weekends and evenings with activities that I enjoyed, with things I found stimulating. You know, and I think it's worth saying as well, like, I still feel bored from time to time now. That still happens to me. But I can just sit there now and I can just tolerate it. Um, whereas when you're only experiencing boredom and you're experiencing all the time, it really is truly intolerable. Next point, you have to claim your own agency. Next mindset shift. Because, you know, around two thirds now of adults in the UK are overweight and half of those are obese, by the way. So it's not just overweight, but half of those are obese. And if that data doesn't shock you at all, I mean, the US is worse. But if that data on the UK doesn't shock you at all, this will. One in three children above the age, age excuse me, of 11 in the UK, one of three children above the age of 11 in the UK are overweight. One in three kids over 11 years old are overweight. Disgraceful. I'm thinking of more crass ways of putting that, but bloody disgraceful. And so you're in a culture 
where obesity is everywhere, where bad food choices are everywhere, where people who enable bad food choices encourage you into terrible lifestyle habits. I mean, the UK as well has a terrible, I don't know, this is not the case in many other countries. So people don't resonate with this until they come to the UK and they see it firsthand. There's a terrible binge drinking culture in the UK as well. And so this is just totally normalized in the culture. So not only do I feel obesity nowadays and being overweight is normalized, bad food choice is normalized. They're, you take it one step further by saying they're enabled. You could even take it if I was in a really, really staunch, angry mood about this. You could even say that it's it's almost now special privilege um, in terms of access to benefits, in terms of, you know, just some of this, this some of the overly protective sort of that's fat phobia rhetoric that you see online. Um, you could almost argue that being overweight is now almost a protected characteristic of people, a protected trait. And that's not just normalization. That's giving something a privilege. And maybe I'm stretching at that one. Maybe I'm clutching at that one. And I know the vast majority of Brits wouldn't agree with that. I know the vast majority of Brits don't walk around claiming that everything is fat phobia. This is a very noisy minority, but good Lord, they are noisy, especially in the online space. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that it's bloody everywhere and we've become quite accepting and tolerant of it. And it, generally speaking, in the Western world, health standards have hugely slipped. And so if you're growing up in this culture, if you're spending a lot of time in this culture with the average person, I don't mean average in a condescending way, I literally mean the average person. Well, you're surrounded by people with poor choices. If you just take a, a, a random profiling of people on the street in the UK, Chances are you're surrounded by people with really bad choices and two thirds of those people are gonna be overweight. And if some of those are children, a startling amount of those will be overweight as well. And so this is just everywhere. This is just everywhere. So I start at this point out by saying, you need to claim your own agency. That's a fancy way of putting it, isn't it? What do you mean? What do I mean by that? Well, you need to not just not be part of that crowd and you need to realize that you as an individual have, you can have a resilience to those things and you can ask for something different from life. Uh, and by put, putting in the work and, 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 excuse me, following through, implementing, got something on my chair here, um, implementing the right actions, you will get a different result from the rest of those people. Um, and But that takes some resilience, right? That takes some immunity. I've talked about this idea years ago, creating this bubble of excellence for yourself and being really careful about what you subject yourself to. Really careful. And this, this is where people might verge on calling me paranoid i suppose maybe i am i don't see that but maybe that could be argued um but being careful about what tv shows they watch being careful about which news channels or news generally they receive information on being careful about which people they hang around with because of their habits and 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 the, the fact that peer pressure is a very real thing that you will experience when you hang out with collectives, when group, when you hang out with groups of people, maybe not one-on-one -on -one individuals, but hang out with groups of people. The social dynamic is very different. Um, and you're going to have to, you're going to have to create some kind of barriers to entry for, for that other stimulus, that other information, other opinions, other philosophies, other ideologies around food. Otherwise you are just gonna go along with everyone else. You are gonna quote unquote drink the Kool-Aid. Um, and so, yeah. I think this is where I would use the word responsibility because when something is the social norm, it's easy to escape responsibility for it. It's easy to say, well, this is what everyone else does and everyone else is overweight. And maybe people that are overweight don't consciously think that, but it comes through in their conduct that, that because it's so widely accepted, it isn't something that they need to change. And that just didn't happen years ago. You know, you'd be bullied and cajoled and shamed into into actually getting fit, into actually getting in shape. And I'm not commenting on whether I find that appropriate or inappropriate. I'm just saying that's what happened. And it probably worked in many cases. As severe as it was, it probably worked. <sighs> Shall we move on? But that, I think that's the end of my point. It's just that if people are soft and, and people just capitulate because society is like that. 
And you're going to have to find clusters of people, accountability partners, people that like I have at my gym and I play tennis. So I'm around people that are generally mostly fit at my martial arts gym. I'm around people that care about their health and well-being. They care about how they present themselves, how they look. They don't just see that that's overly vain. They see the value in, well, no, I need to take care of my appearance. And that ties in very directly with my health. And that's going to make my whole life better. And that's going to make me a whole bunch happier and successful person. Um, and you want to be around people like that. And if you can't find people like that for a while, you, that could be your long term vision. If you can't track people like that into your life for a while, well, you at least need to create some separation and boundary between the people in your life that have bad habits. And this doesn't mean cutting people off. There's a lot of nonsense in the new age self help stuff now. Like, get rid of toxic people, get rid of anyone that doesn't agree with you. Like, this is just. This is, a, this is just making people lonely, just cutting everyone off. That's ridiculous. You know, you're not going to cut your family off because they have a different opinion on food or because they don't get how driven or ambitious you are because they're a little bit different in some way. Like, this is just ridiculous. But this is like new age self-help nonsense now. It's, you just be lonely. Cut everyone off. Everyone is toxic. Everyone is horrible. It's, it's ridiculous. It's an overcorrection. But you are going to have to start thinking about thinking about what you're doing with folks, thinking about where you're going with loved ones. And, and saying to people, look, yeah, I'm going to come to the party, but I'm going to bring my own food. Is that OK? I'll bring some for you guys. You're going to have to be OK with going to a restaurant with people and, and ordering a healthy item on the menu. And when people say, oh, don't you want a burger? Is that all you're having? Don't you want pizza? Da, da, da. When you're met with those comments, you need to be cool with saying, yeah, I'm good. I got my stuff. What are you having? And turn it back on them. What are you having? No, this looks really good to me. This is all I want right now. You know what? I had a, a pretty large lunch. That's a good excuse. It's a white lie. I don't encourage lying. But maybe you did have a big lunch, maybe it's the truth. But no, look, I had a good lunch. You know, I just have something small here. I want something nutritious. I'm working on my health right now. What about you? What are you having? Turn it back on there. You're going to have to be cool and calm and non-reactive with doing these things if you want to survive as a slim person in the modern world, because it is getting harder and harder because of the change in cultural norms. Next mental shift I want to run you through here. You're running your own race. Please keep in mind you're running your own race. This comparison making stuff, it is, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And, you know, the amount of clients I have conversations with, not to belittle my clients here, um, but the amount of my clients I have conversations with, and they're like, Ryan, it seems that so-and-so in the program is losing, someone in the Facebook group mentioned they're losing or they've lost X weight in eight weeks. And I seem to be a little bit behind that. Is there something wrong? I mean, that's a, that's a really valid question. So I'm not don't want to sound really dismissive of that question. It's actually a really well put question if that was the wording. But I think a lot of people, they are comparing themselves unnecessarily. And by the way, comparisons are helpful because they set benchmarks. They give you expectations and frameworks from what you can expect. They can help you set goals. I think if you take someone of a similar body weight and similar stats to you, like height, you know, gender, so on and so forth, and, and then you look at their progress to measure against your own. I don't think that's completely ridiculous. I don't think comparisons are automatically bad, but I do think people get lost in them. And I do think people hear these wondrous stories of someone online who lost 80 pounds in three months on a plant-based diet and then get sad that they've only lost 20, which is 20 is an amazing amount of weight to lose in three months. For Even for someone over 250, 300 pounds, 20 pounds is still a decent achievement. And so just, oh, I've actually watched people quit weight loss when they're actually losing weight because they believe it's not fast enough. And I'm just like, what on earth was your expectation? How reasonable was it? Because if your expectation was reasonable in the first place and you are losing weight slowly, do something, tweak, you know, hack that plateau, do some tweaks. But if you're actually flying down the scale at a, a rate that is very appropriate, healthy and sustainable and safe for someone of your body weight, but because you heard so-and-so online lost weight 10 pounds faster or your friend doing the keto diet is losing weight faster, do not let that bend you. Do not let how quickly someone else is losing weight get your head turned when you've got a perfectly acceptable rate of progress yourself. Running your own race. And like people do this in the gym all the time. It's like, oh, so-and-so. Like, you see this with the gym bros. Oh, so-and-so's got oh, – that guy's got massive arms. Or with the girls, oh, she's got a great butt. And, it's, you know – the people that you're comparing yourself to, they're often looking back at you and thinking, oh, they've got a wonderful smile. Uh, or, or maybe it's something personality-based, or maybe it's something physical too. They're like, oh, man, he's got awesome arms. He's got cool short, like good shoulders. You know, this, there's always something to admire in people, right? 
and and that uniqueness and, and that authenticity authenticity we have as, as human beings people have loads of you know even quote unquote unsuccessful people have loads of admirable skills and loads of admirable traits and so i think that's what comparisons lack they lack the context of the fact that the person you're comparing yourself to is also comparing themselves to you and other people and doing the exact same thing having a slightly different internal conversation about what they're comparing to but they're doing a similar thing back i think it's it's really nice to hear it's, it's really cool to realize oh everyone compares like i do it all the time like it, i think it's refreshing to hear that oh okay that's just what we do that's just what we do and you can train yourself out of it though and you must train yourself out of it and um, and i think you do that by understanding that it's that it's that it's contextual um and it lacks um comparisons lack context actually don't they because you often don't think about the journey someone's gone on how much work they've put in their starting point maybe they've got a much higher activity level than you and that explains why they're losing weight maybe they're 30 years younger than you and that explains why metabolically hormonally they might have advantages that you don't none of this stuff is set in stone i don't like to use age as an excuse with weight loss but it's undeniably a factor that can that can uh, slow things down. But we lack that context sometimes. So just remember comparisons lack context and you are running your own race. When I'm working with my clients, I'm not necessarily thinking who's losing the weight the fastest, who's losing weight the slowest, oh, therefore they're doing a bad job, no. I'm thinking about them as an individual, them as a client, my experience with them on their, you know, the, the two, three, four, five, six weeks, three months, four months, they've been on Vegan Summit Sustain. And all of that insight and perspective that I've developed working with that individual, knowing their starting point, knowing their data, height, current weight, et cetera, et cetera, age, factoring in all of that. And then I'm asking, is this person losing enough weight for them? It's not being compared to anyone else. And we've got these sort of one to two pounds a week ball marks, uh, ballparks. And I like that. I like that as a rule of thumb, but it's just that it's a rule of thumb and there always are exceptions to it. Next mental shift I want to share is that consistency is not the same as intensity. Consistency is not the same as intensity. Intensity is about hard work. Intensity is about graft. Consistency is about showing up day on day and doing the right stuff. And I think a lot of people conflate the two. And what I ask of my clients is that they aren't intense, but they are consistent. I don't want them to start my program and do the max amount possible to lose weight. And they're not allowed to anyway. So there's accountability measures that are put in place for this. I make it perfectly clear. I want them to stick to their plans and not cut meals, skip things out in their diet, take the avocado out because they're under the impression, the false impression that the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Um, do even more exercise than what my program asks them to do. I don't usually allow my clients to do that because I'm not looking for intensity. I am not looking for aggressive weight loss. I'm not looking for my clients to do the max amount of possible to lose the max amount of weight in their time with me. I'm not interested in that. My program is called Vegan Slim and Sustain for a reason. The clues in the name, as I always say, slim and sustained. We are looking for you to actually change and find some longevity in what we're doing here. We want your results to be permanent. So yes, we want to lose weight, but we also want to do it in conjunction with fixing your relationship with food, improving your habits, mastering the cravings, changing your limiting beliefs and stories about exercise, instilling you with confidence and a trust in yourself that you didn't have prior to the program, a trust in yourself around food, giving you a sense of control and power over food rather than feeling like it's in charge of you. You're powerless to it. Um, and it's those things I want to do for my clients. This is why I emphasize so much the mental and emotional side of things. This is why I constantly argue that the mental and emotional side of things is not nearly talked about enough in the online space, especially the online sort of vegan plant-based community. It's all about food, food, food all the time. Everything's about oh, what I eat in a day. Here are this, my simple, here are my three favorite vegan meals. Like all of this stuff has merit. I probably sound like so patronizing. All of this stuff has merit as content, but no, <laughs> I say nobody, that's a sweeping generalization, but very few people are talking about the mental and emotional side of weight loss and it's the missing piece of the puzzle you can have the best plan in the world you can have the healthiest vegan meals on the planet they're not going to do anything for you if you're not consistent or they're not going to do much for you if you're not consistent and consistency requires a decent relationship with food it requires a decent mindset and that's why i'm making this video 
So hopefully you can take some insights and inject them into your weight loss strategy and some new perspectives on how to, to, to master the mindset for weight loss. Um, I've digressed slightly. It was all about consistency, not intensity. So that's what we're going for here. We're going for actual genuine change, for longevity, for a sense that this is permanent for you this time. Let me drink from my sexy mug again. It's funny because I'm talking about really serious stuff. I'm talking about how to help people lose weight, improve their health. And then I bring this ridiculous looking mug on. It's like serious. The juxtaposition is great. Serious with the world's most sort of over the top flamboyant mug. <laughs> it just doesn't work. It's a juxtaposition, isn't it? Um, where were we? But yeah, yeah. It, I, I don't want my clients to do the max possible to be really aggressive. I just ask for consistency. And consistency... You, you know, consistency over perfection is, is you know, it's it's become cliche, hasn't it? It's become ultimate cheese, self-help cheese, hasn't it? It's so cliche. But I like it. I like that saying. But it is cliche. Consistency over perfection. My clients can still eat out. They can still eat out once a week. They can still have the occasional, you know, half a pint of beer, G&T glass of wine. I don't forbid those things. I don't ban those things because I want this to feel practical to people. I want this feel to feel real world to people. And if I was shooting for perfection or if I was shooting for intensity, I wouldn't permit those things. And maybe at times I don't, of some clients in certain scenarios, I don't permit those things and I don't allow bending of the rules. But generally, I'm maybe more tolerant than my persona on YouTube would suggest. And I do allow some wiggle room for clients. And think about it like this. If you're eating one meal out a week, let's say it's not something particularly health conscious like a vegan burger of course i'd rather when you eat out it's something decent but let's say it is a vegan burger if you're eating out once a week that's one in 21 meals that's not nearly enough to disrupt your progress certainly on the scale the bigger risk is the sort of slippery slope that can ensue when you start eating out and introducing foods into your diet and so on and so forth anyway i digress we are just after consistency so what i would say to you is ask yourself what makes me consistent what makes me inconsistent Am I sometimes shooting for a far too Puritan approach? Am I actually at risk of starving myself? I drive my calories so low that it actually threatens my consistency because I'm trying to be really Puritan. Those green juices that I love, can I still incorporate them into my diet, but maybe I don't make them a meal because they're like 200 calories and then I starve myself, right? This is all aggressive, intense stuff. We ain't interested in this. And you wouldn't be here on this channel if, if you wanted that. There are other channels out there that, that, that permit that. Um, but yeah, yeah, consistency is not the same as intensity. And in my notes here, I forgot to say this earlier. This is a good question to ask. Is it realistic and practical to be perfect all the time? I suppose it depends what we mean by perfect, doesn't it? Um, but yeah, weight loss is certainly a result of consistent action over time. It's a series of habits and behaviors that get stringed together that provide results rather than just these short bursts of intensity that, that can't really be sustained so don't get too caught up in in the failures and and the what if scenarios um that's what people do i was just speaking to my client earlier and they were like oh ryan i've been going well the last few days but i'm really worried about what's gonna happen tomorrow i'm really worried about what's gonna reveal its ugly head you know what which sort of bad habits from the past are gonna crop up tomorrow and it it's very easy to do this it's very easy via future pacing to uh to get worried about this stuff but what i would say is like you need a bit more of a recency bias. Like if you've been doing well lately anyway, stop judging yourself for, for past mistakes so much, for mistakes from weeks and months ago so much. So yeah, don't get too caught up in, in the failures, the potential failures or the what if moments, what's gonna happen tomorrow? What about next week when I eat out? Those are genuine challenges. And like if my clients have a, a, a potential roadblock coming up in a couple of days time, they've got a trip or a vacation, I'm gonna help them with those things. But what I'll always say to them is look, your stress about eating healthy, on a trip or a vacation or what you're gonna eat when we look at this menu from the restaurant you're going to for Heather's leaving due next week at work. You know, you'll stress about that. That We cannot afford to let that take you off track today because that's what people do. People will know, oh, vacation's coming up. It's in two days. Well, I may as well start it now. I'll have a beer now. Yeah, we're finishing work, it's Christmas. Like people start celebrating Christmas on, the, on the December the 1st. People start eating mince pies in the UK on December the 1st. And they just, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They just accept. It's a script. Oh, my Christmas weight, my winter weight gain. People joke about it. People joke. It's like, I shouldn't be laughing. I shouldn't be laughing. It's bloody serious. Um, but yeah, don't get too caught up with that stuff. You know, if you do have a roadblock or a challenge ahead, that is no excuse not to go off track now. To go off track now, Rob. Um, so yeah, and I think we are, 
I think perfection is actually easy to avoid when you're not desperately needy for weight loss. This is what drives people into aggressive strategies. This is what drives people to really low calorie diets and, and detoxes and juice fasting. They are really needy about losing weight quickly for something, whatever it is. Um, and I think when you can detach from that a little bit, when you can say to yourself, well, I'll see how much weight I can lose this year as opposed to this month, you can more easily channel just a nice, calm, safe rate of weight loss. You can more easily uh, implement strategies that, that encourage that and work with that. Next point, the faster you can take action, the faster you can grow. This is a really important mental shift. Um, it's, I can't, you know, I, I don't speak to all of, of my, my YouTube audience here. The vast majority of people, I'll never hear from you. I don't know your name. I don't know where you're from. But there are people that engage with me on YouTube. There are people that engage with me on Instagram. The amount of people who I have messages from since early on in my years doing this, Three, four years. If I scroll back, you know, every six months they pop up with a question. Oh, Ryan, how did you make your hummus? Or what was in this recipe? Or Ryan, have you got any advice about craving? If I scroll back, oh, Ryan, I'm interested in your program. If I scroll back through our messages, there's many people who have been messaging me for years. They're in the exact same spot. They're in the exact same spot. They've got all the information in the world. If anything, they've got too much information. It's called a, causing sort of overwhelm and, and confusion. And they just need one process, one plan. And just go bang done. That's why. That's why people ideally, if they can afford it, people have a coach because it's just like bang, here's your plan, go, um, and just trust in that process. But yeah, the faster you can take action, the faster you can grow. Do I really even need to explain this one? The amount of people that sit on the fence year on year and say, "This is the year, January the first. I'm going to lose weight. I've got my New Year's resolutions. I'm going to finally do this now." And then I I see them again, or I hear from them again six months down the line. Oh. Yeah, how did that go? Hey, are you still going to the gym? It's only a very small amount of people. It's only the, the, the success rate in weight loss is a very small amount of people. Roughly 70 to 90% of people gain the weight back and more in some cases, sadly. And so 70 to 90%, it's, it's just not a great statistic, is it? Right? You can understand why people don't even bother when they see that happening. Um, so yeah, the, the faster that you can just jump in head first and say, right, I'm going to embrace this, I'm going to do this, the faster you're going to get feedback for your efforts. The faster the scale is going to tell you whether the strategy you're, you're doing is actually working, is if it's actually producing weight loss, the faster you're going to get to see what your challenges are in terms of cravings, the faster you'll begin to see how your relationship with food is improving. People just dilly-dally, word of the day been saying that loads recently i love that people just dilly dally and they dip their toes in and they don't fully immerse and then they're doing another diet three weeks later and oh now i read the starch solution oh what about nutritarian oh then it, people just it's, good. it's just a bloody roundabout isn't it it's a merry-go-round of, of of different magic pills and different weight loss methods and people just go round and round in circles i've had people had a couple of people recently who have followed me for years. They've even inquired about coaching for years. And they're finally on vegan, slim, and sustain. And they're finally smashing it. They're flying down the scale. And they'll say to me two or three times throughout the program, they're like, Ryan, I love what's happening here, but I've just got this huge guilt. Why didn't I join your program years ago? And there's answers for that. Maybe they didn't know me as well. Maybe they didn't trust me. Maybe it was when I was... You know, they hadn't been following me long enough to feel a great deal of trust in me. I don't think I'm a particularly untrustworthy character. But you get what I mean. And and they just, uh, but it's usually about them. It's usually about their own fears and insecurities and, and lack of commitment and wobbling focus. And sometimes you just need to jump in head first and it's amazing. And the results and, and the growth and the lessons that come when you actually do that, when you actually try, who would have thought? I don't think this is rocket science. And yeah, sorry, um, in my notes here, the importance of taking action, I've just gone off piece with everything we've got today, but the, the notes are actually better than me just slowly talking away here. Very, uh, just a very steady pace conversationally. But um, one of the bullets I've got here is when you take action, you're constantly testing methods and strategies. Procrastination, no testing, yeah. So you're figuring out what works and what doesn't work and you're actually getting that feedback and then you can go and implement those lessons. The faster you can fail, the faster you will grow. Oh, I like that. The faster you can fail, the faster you will grow. Failing and finding out what does not work is still better than doing nothing at all. Amen. 
Amen, Ryan Adams. That's good advice, Ryan Adams. I like that. So, yeah, the question being, is the fear of action holding you back? The fear of action or the fear of failure. So not just doing the thing, but doing the thing and then it not working. Is it holding you back? Um, and I made a video years ago, and I think I talked about this in Mind Mastery for Weight Loss. Are you being punished? This idea of are you being punished or are you being prepared? It would be easy for me to look back at the four years before I went vegan, when I was really up and down the scale, and say, why is this not working for me? I've tried everything. I've got all the time on my hands. I'm at uni. Time in the world on my hands. I'm at uni. Like, if I can't make this work now, I'm never going to make this work. Almost feeling like I was being punished. The reframe now in hindsight being, no, it all prepared me so that when I learned about healthy, whole food, plant-based diets, I actually was persistent, self-believing, established habits around gym bro foods, like, these were not foods necessarily that were all that good for me, but at least I had habits, at least I had some practice of consistency. It was very broken, but some practice of consistency, more so than when I was 18, by the time I finished uni, of barring the boredom eating, day to day at least. And, and so when I discovered whole foods, plant-based eating, it was like the right combination of an amazing effective strategy for weight loss that filled the gaps and plugged the leaks that I'd been struggling with. But also my mind was in the best place Ever. It wasn't perfect, but it was in the best place that it had ever been to actually consistently apply and implement a whole foods plant based diet. Does that make sense? So this is a good reframe. Like for any of you that are fearful about doing this, for any of you scared to try weight loss one more time because you failed so many times in the past, what I would say is, have you been punished or have you been prepared? Maybe this is the perfect time for you because of all those lessons you've learned from the mistakes of the past. So think about think about uh, think about that. Think about that. <laughs> the mug is awesome. Yeah. I don't know about awesome. <laughs> I don't know about awesome. You said that, not me. Failure self-talk examples. How come I still have belly fat? I should be further ahead of where I am. We talked about that earlier on. My friend is getting results. Why aren't I? Comparisons, comparisons, comparisons. What else do I want to talk about? What else do I want to talk about? Identity. Identity is called cool to talk about here in my notes. This is really important for the mental emotional side. We've done a bit of emotional eating. We've sort of interjected between cravings and we've covered a whole bunch on relationship with food and limiting beliefs. Let's do identity quickly before we finish. Um, you need to find your identity in who you are, not what you do. And, and, and this is really, really crucial. This is really, really crucial because people make their identity about their actions. And I've always found this a big mistake. I'm a chocoholic. I can't live without wine night. It's all about actions, but you need to make it who you are. So here's some examples of this. I know this is so broken, folks, this live stream. It's like it's it's not concise. It's all over the place, but thanks for staying with me. Hopefully it's still useful regardless of, of the lower pace, the slower pace. I want to eat more fruits and vegetables. You might be saying, I want to eat more fruits and vegetables. I want to eat a healthy plant-based diet. Reframe it as I'm a fruit and vegetable eater. You see what I mean? You take it from action to who you are, to identity. I want to drink less alcohol can be reframed as, I'm a less alcohol drinker. I know it sounds funny, but these are little reframes that can really help you see different. I want to keep a food journal to keep track of my nutrition can be reframed as, I'm a food journal. I want to run more so I can get fit. I'm a fitness focused runner. You get what I mean? We take the action and we create identity around it, but not bad identity. Not bad identity, like, I'm a chocoholic, right? And just accepting that that is us and that is who we are and, and therefore we've got a preordained script. And here's a little excerpt from my book, Mind Mastery for Weight Loss, that you can get at naturalweightlossmastery.com if you're interested. Remember that behavior follows identity. To encourage the optimal behavior so you reach your goals, you must start by looking at how you relate to yourself. These admittedly subtle sounding reframes that I've just given you, they can help you be to begin to do just that. Repetition of new habits will help reshape your identity over time. Sorry, over time. Whilst the identity shift that came with my transition to a plant-based approach was a fairly quick one, it was filled with many days and weeks of new consistently practiced habits. When you act deliberately in consistency, uh, consistently, excuse me, your subconscious will become familiar with your new behaviors and gradually your sense of self will begin to change. 
This is one of an endless list of reasons why consistency is the key to weight loss. So main takeaway from that is behavior follows identity. You start to inform yourself through action of who you are, but you actually need to do that action enough to whereby it becomes repetition and your brain can be begin to expect it. And there are two types of identity. I've talked about this many times. Personal identity, which is your sense of self and the way in which you relate to yourself, how you view yourself, I'm a chocoholic, and social identity, other people view me as a chocoholic. Other people make jokes about my chocolate addictions. So social identity, therefore, being the perception of others in a social setting, in a group, contributing to your sense of self as well. Social identity feeds into personal identity and vice versa. So what I would say, in summary, in the identity point is... Sorry, just skipping ahead in my notes here. Before you decide what you want to do, you must first decide who you want to become. And I love this. Think about that vision for your future self. And this is an exercise that I'll often have my clients do. If they're struggling to sort of, they know they want to lose weight, but they're struggling to sort of visualize it or know how much precisely weight they want to lose. I'll ask them, well, what is your vision for future you, Jane? Paul, Steve, right? Who do you want to become? What does that look like? Not just what, what does that look like in a superficial sense? What does that feel like to you, right? How much energy do you have? What metrics can we put on this? What's your relationship with food like? How do you want to think and feel about food? Do you want to eat out? Like, let's, let's break this down. Like, who do you want to be when this journey is done? Who do you want to be? And that's going to inform you of what to do along the way. So yeah, this has been really broken, but yeah, identity, huge. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's a really obvious one. Does that need to be talked about? Comfort zones and weight loss. Are you comfortable being overweight and fearful of being slim as a result because you're so comfortable being overweight? Have you just accept that? Do you feel comfortable watching Netflix instead of working out? The answer to these questions for many people is yes. You're going to have to be okay with, with challenging that and, and feeling uncomfortable. Uh, what else is in my notes here? I was going to talk about this for five minutes, but I think it's run its course and I feel myself a low energy now. That's when I know I need a break. Um, the battle is fought in the mind before you see success in the physical form we know this you have to get this mindset stuff. maybe that's a good place to finish because you have to get this mindset stuff right because it's going to allow the actions on the surface level so much weight loss content so much advice that you hear online from the diet gurus and whatnot it's all about actions it's all action based it's all surface level and that stuff matters that stuff has merit i don't mean to demean it half of my job the vast majority of my youtube videos here they are about surface level stuff they are about meals and programming and calories and strategy and exercise da, 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 da. they're about surface level actions but think about mindset through as the vehicle through which you execute on those actions and if this isn't right you only get so far so hopefully as scattered as unstructured as uh as sort of droning on, I was droning on a little bit today. I wasn't as concise as I would have ideally liked to be. As much as I'm not massively proud of, of this live stream, I still think, well, I am proud of it. There's still lots of info here that can really help you if you apply it. And I hope you feel the same way after listening to this. But if you do need also the surface level stuff and you, and you need the diet advice, you've just run into my channel for the first time and, and you'd like to know a little bit more about what and how to eat for weight loss, what to do with exercise, so on and so forth, you can check out in the description, I've put a link to uh, my free uh, No BS Vegan Weight Loss Guide so you can have a read of that. If you want to just cut to the chase, fast track your progress uh, and work with me, you can have a, head over, excuse me, to ryanadamscoaching.com, ryanadamscoaching.com and learn a little bit more about my vegan slim and sustain program. Still got uh, five spaces available for this coming Monday, June 26th. So get in touch for that. Those spaces will fill up. I expect them to. So get in touch shortly for that.